Hi, this is Jurgen Rasmus, and welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis blog. I'm very excited to make today's episode, which is about Dr. John Sarno. This is a video where I'm going to critique John Sarno's teachings on chronic pain, what I perceive to be the strengths and the weaknesses of his teachings and his approach. John Sarno, by the way, is a medical doctor who really made a mark on this world. He's, he's impacted tens of thousands of lives through his lectures, through his books, through his innovations. Uh, he's a man who truly would have deserved the Nobel Prize in medicine and the deep respect and appreciation of his fellow medical doctors. Unfortunately, he never really received either. But let's look into John Sarno. So first of all, I came across the work of John Sarno in 1998 when I was 21 years old. I was in California attending a trainer's training in neurolinguistic programming or NLP for short. And during that particular NLP training, um, our instructor, a guy by the name of Tad James, mentioned Sarno. And I got curious. And I went to a Barnes & Noble bookstore and picked up a couple of John Sarno's books and read them. And in that period of my life, I had some recurring episodes of chronic back pain. And the books really made an instantaneous difference with my own back pain. And I was, I was puzzled and curious as to how just reading a book and understanding something could make pain go away. Now, personally for me too, what, what I found really fascinating was, if you're familiar with fields such as NLP and, and, and hypnosis or various forms of psychotherapy, they're very often quite technique oriented. And at this phase of my life, I was very much into techniques and subtleties and complexity. And I was just stunned that this medical doctor who didn't seem to have any psychological techniques whatsoever was just helping people get rid of the basis for their chronic pain just through lectures and information and books. It fascinated me to no end. So as a result of this, I read everything I could comb over uh, uh, by Sarno. Um, I watched some of his work. I've studied the work of his well-known students and since then, you know, I'm making this video in 2022, I've had well over two decades of experience in helping people from all over the planet eliminate and get rid of chronic pain, largely based upon John Sarno's theories. So I, I think I'm in a pretty good position, both personally, uh, and just through uh, sheer client experience, having seen as many clients, to offer an opinion of what I think are the strengths and the weaknesses of his particular approach. First, a little bit about Dr. John Sarno. So he went to medical school and graduated as a medical doctor from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Then he had uh, a 10 year period where he worked in, in upstate New York as a general practitioner of medicine. And then he became associated with the NYU Medical Center, Rusk Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine. Now, initially, he worked mostly with people who had strokes and spinal cord injuries, people who had lost a limb through, you know, through amputation, and did a lot of work with physical therapy, intense physical therapy over time, 
And notice that the majority of these patients did seem to make improvements. Then, in 1965, he was reassigned to the outpatient clinic at Rusk. He became the director of um, the back pain clinic. And here, he had the opposite experience. And that experience was that most of the uh, patients did not seem to benefit uh, from physical therapy and exercise and all of these sorts of regimes. You know, the, 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 the patients would go from practitioner to practitioner and, and hardly make any progress whatsoever. And Sarno, being a curious, pragmatic, results-oriented doctor who cared about what was true, began to realize that something was seriously wrong with how we conceptualized pain. And of course, today, in 2022, a lot of the science has proven Sarno to be right. There are a lot of studies that show clearly that the vast majority of people without chronic pain have solid structural abnormalities in the back, for example. Herniated discs, uh, arthritis, um, so on and so forth. But if you take away cancer, infections, and broken bones, the MRI images have zero predictive value in showing you who's in pain, who's not in pain, and where people might have pain. So you have a lot of people who have backs that look really, really bad, who have no pain. And then you have people who have pain in the wrong places. And then you have people who have a little bit of structural abnormalities and are basically invalids. So Sono began to become deeply suspicious that chronic pain was not, in fact, caused by structural abnormalities. He also looked at, so he, he looked at the, the low success rate in physical therapy and, and exercise and massage and applying heat and these sorts of interventions. And he also, of course, looked into the, uh, the very shaky uh, back industry where it's been revealed that the vast majority of back surgeries for most people are not, in fact, successful. So Sarno began to suspect that chronic pain is not, in the vast majority of cases, caused by structural abnormalities, but it's created by our emotional life. It's generated by the brain, by psychological factors. That a healthy body, so to speak, can be in tremendous pain. And, and that the mechanism likely is that the brain just chooses to restrict blood flow to a particular area so that you have mild oxygen deprivation. And when this happens, we have pain and that the brain can do this at any time. So Sarno discovered that if he could persuade his patients to lose belief in the idea that the pain was a result of structural abnormalities and instead begin to see that this is generated by psychological factors, the pain is real, right? But generated by psychological factors, then the pain had a tendency to go away. So what Sarno became extremely skilled at was to persuade people by logic, facts, evidence, through lectures, through books, through consultations, that the structural abnormality theories of chronic pain did not hold up and to get them to orient psychologically. He again, hypothesized that the mechanism was um, a lack of blood flow to a particular area, which resulted in mild oxygen deprivation. 
and his hypothesis was also that the function that chronic pain serves whether it's fibromyalgia chronic back pain migraine irritable bowel syndrome uh, chronic fatigue that the function that the pain serves is as a distractor uh, a way for the brain to shift the attention onto the physical body so that the person not experience certain unthinkable thoughts or emotions and that as long as the person is convinced that there's something wrong with their body and they keep doing massages and physical therapy that kind of endorses the distraction so what sarno did is he would have them discontinue all the physical treatments and get them to orient towards their psychological life and he had excellent results doing this back in 1998 um, the 2020 host, John Stossel, uh, had his own issues with back pain, which he had had for decades. He went to Sarno once and his pain cleared. And he was so impressed by this that he made a 2020 segment where his journalists were allowed to take, uh, look into Sarno's files and call random patients and the feedback they got just blew them away. And about 15 million people watched this segment with John Stossel and uh, uh, John Sarno. So, so Sarno kind of became America's back pain doctor. Um, his first book was released in 1982. He released his, his bestseller. Uh, healing back pain in 1991 which sold over a million copies his last book the divided mind was released in 2006 um, other celebrities really did a good job in spreading uh, Sarno's message Howard Stern the radio host is another person who had had back pain for decades and who had a couple of meetings with Sarno and his pain completely went away uh, the director of Seinfeld, uh, Tony Schwartz. So if you if you go to Amazon and you punch in John Sarno, uh, one of his book titles, you, you'll, you'll see a large amount of people who have been in pain for decades who just by reading one of his books and getting it have been able to get rid of their pain. I've had many such results too uh, in my career. I remember working with a woman in Australia many years ago who was a physiotherapist who had had back pain since 1989. So for almost 30 years by the time I worked with her, she released it in one session. Um, I have had numerous people who have had multiple back surgeries uh, to little or no avail who have been able to completely let go of their pain. So I've been able to verify and see these sorts of results time and time again in my own practice. Uh, Sarno also did a very good job in helping people to relate their pain to certain personality tendencies. So the tendencies of perfectionism of being very conscientious, hard drive, putting a lot of pressure on oneself, being perfectionistic, self-critical, um, one's own worst critic, and, and, and also the, 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 the martyrs, the, the people who seem to put other people's needs uh, uh, above their own and, and who are very self-sacrificing who put enormous pressure on themselves to be good people. Sono's theory was that this generated enormous internal tension, often rage, and that to not feel that or be in contact with that, the brain would generate pain as a distraction. And that the way out of it is to orient your attention back to your emotional life. Another big part of the Sono program was to get people to act against their pain, to not baby their backs. 
uh, and, and, and this would reduce the fear and, and help them help them get over the pain. Now, despite Sarno's enormous actual success with clients, he was for the most part ignored by his colleagues. He was not popular among other medical doctors. Many reasons for this. You know, A, we pretty much live in a pharmacy where uh, big pharmaceutical companies pretty much run the show in, in, in conjunction with the state and guild interests. So um, when Sarno got popular, you know, people would cancel their surgeries, cancel their physical therapy, not want to do the drugs, you know, and, and, and this does not make you a popular person um, among other medical doctors. So, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing is that most physicians think like mechanics. They're, they're, they're deeply steeped in a mind-body split, a very reductionistic uh, mindset. Even though the science show us that mind and body is one integrated system and that there's a lot of evidence that what we call psychological and emotional factors have strong influence on our so-called physical health, in actual medical practice, this mostly seems to be ignored. So Sarno's kind of mind-body theory that the brain, that the mind could generate enormous pain did not fit into the medical reductionistic mind-body split model where people think like mechanics and therefore are likely to, to think that anything they deem physical shall be treated with uh, drugs, surgeries, injections, and perhaps exercise, you know, stuff like emotions and thought patterns and personality tendencies and relationships doesn't really um, easily find a home uh, within that framework. Uh, Sarno did have one day in the sun back in 2012, a Democratic senator by the name of, uh, uh, what was his name here? I'm going to have to find it in my notes. Senator Tom Harkin uh, brought Sarno into the U.S. Senate, a hearing on health, education, pain, and labor, where Sarno... And, and Tom Harkin had had uh, pain and read Sarno and never had any pain since. And, and, and he was curious as to why isn't this being looked at? Why, why isn't anyone mentioning this? Why is it only, only drugs? Uh, there, there's also a documentary out called Old Rage, which is kind of a tribute to Sarno and his teachings. So I highly recommend looking into it. Now, here are some of the um, some of the weaknesses I think in Sarno's uh, approach, and some ideas for what can be done to improve the results. So, as I said, a lot of people have had uh, enormous success just in reading one of Sarno's books. At the same time, a lot of, for a lot of people, that's not quite sufficient. Some people need to do psychological work on themselves. And that's often who you get, you know, as a client, if you work with this sort of stuff. So in terms of, in terms of Sarno's approach and weaknesses, I think that Sarno emphasized rage. Uh, and repression a bit too much. I think that the whole Freudian element of repressed emotions is probably the Achilles heel or the weak part of Sarno's framework. If you look at uh, doctors working today who are influenced by Sarno and trained by Sarno, uh, people like Daniel Schechter, uh, people like Howard Schubiner, uh, pain psychologists such as Alan Gordon, 
they have a tendency to emphasize the influence of fear more and that seems that makes sense to me too so i suspect that what happens for a lot of people who are able to shift or eliminate their pain using sarno's approach is that fear goes down meaning as as as, as long as people deeply believe that the intense pain that they're feeling is a signal that something's wrong with the body and and and, and even something that hasn't been uh, discovered yet that fear in and of itself makes them more pain sensitive there's a kind of fear pain loop that just keeps going where neutral body sensations are interpreted as if there is an inherent threat there so I strongly suspect that what often happens when people lose their faith in the idea that the pain equals something being structurally wrong and they begin to tie it to their emotional life is that they lose a lot of that fear. So the fear pain cycle is broken and they're able to release their pain. If, if you look at, uh, there, there's, there's something called TMS Wall of Victory on YouTube, where you see testimonials from people who have uh, eliminated their own chronic pain by listening or reading to Sarno. If you, if you listen to these interviews, you're not going to find, I think, as far as I can see, a single case where someone said, yeah, I oriented inwards and my repressed rage exploded and came to the surface. That's, that's not what people respond. I even see with most of my clients who have shifted their pain. It's, it, it's not that they get in touch with repressed rage when doing this. It's, it's that they lose their fear of the pain. So what seems to be happening too, if you look at these TMS Wall of Victory interviews, is that A, there, 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 there's suddenly a, 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 a ton of bricks type insight, a big aha moment, either a big one or a kind of creeping one over time, where they begin to realize that, hey, this, this pain is not due to something being wrong in my body. It's, it's created by psychological factors really getting that not just intellectually but like really getting it that seems to be the the big part and the other big part seems to be to lose one's fear by acting against the pain beginning to you know do exercises and stay in that stay with the pain to discover that it's not dangerous. So for example, I work with a young guy in Boston uh, over Skype who had carpal tunnel syndrome, who had to drop out of college, you know, couldn't do any typing anymore, couldn't even do one push up, uh, had enormous pain. Uh, medical tests showed that there was nothing wrong with his wrists or his, his arms, you know. So, so, so for him, getting him to, to act against the pain getting him to, to, to push through it gradually while persuading him that there was nothing wrong and that a healthy brain could generate the pain, you know, over a three week period, the pain completely disappeared. So that seems to be what's going on when people actually release the pain, you know, Regarding this idea of repressed emotions, I've heard many cases of people saying, well, you know, I, I read that Sarno book, I, I, had, uh, I had intense pain, I, I started thinking of, you know, where in my life might I be angry, I started brainstorming, you know, and, and then the pain disappeared. And it's usually not that people report feeling angry like 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 that but 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 just orienting the attention towards the emotional life seems to be doing the trick it's very hard to prove this idea of repressed emotions 
clearly we human beings have the capacity to distract ourselves from things so if if you look at a kind of conscious version of this let's say you have someone who is in emotional pain they know that they're in emotional pain so they they cut themselves like voluntarily now they do this because they prefer the voluntary experienced physical pain to what they perceive as non-voluntary emotional pain. We know that human beings have the capacity to do this. Sarno, in, in line with Freud, and of course most of Freud's theories have been you know, uh, highly discredited, promotes this as a completely unconscious mechanism that there are emotions there that our brain produces pain for us not to feel i have a lot of experience in presenting that idea and people changing that doesn't necessarily in and of itself prove that there is such a thing as repressed emotion you you, you can prove that well i can postulate that and work with it as if it's the case and when people change i use that as evidence that my theory was was right um if if you look at the big scandal in psychology in the 80s and 90s the whole repressed memory epidemic where people started to remember memories of childhood sexual abuse in therapy we're talking about people who had no memory of that before they entered therapy and then they were sold the idea that certain symptoms meant that they must have likely repressed something and they, they, they went through highly suggestive forms of therapy and then they started you know remembering memories of course most of the people who did that never got any better it, it, it didn't help them it was usually a really uh, a, a really bad thing but from what we know of the memory research, that there's really very little evidence that there is such thing as repressed uh, memories. Might there be repressed emotion then? Well, I, I do strongly suspect that we sometimes, in an effort to not feel something, generate pain or generate some sort of distraction instead. Uh, I, I I think there's something to that, uh, even though I can't really prove it, you know, as as a as a fact. In um, if if you want to look into this, there's there's some really interesting books by a neurologist called uh, Susan O'Sullivan, and she writes about what's being called resignation syndrome in Sweden. There are hundreds of kids in Sweden who are seemingly asleep, I'll say seemingly, sometimes for months and even years at a time, their reflexes are intact, they don't open their eyes. Uh, EEG shows that they're not actually asleep. I mean, they're, they're but uh, they don't really seem to respond much to external uh, stimuli. They're, they're essentially living and acting and behaving as if they're asleep. Um, hundreds of kids. Now, this this only happens with kids and teenagers and young people who are in the family of asylum seekers, right? And you have hundreds of them in Sweden. Of course, neurologists and medical doctors tend to look to, you know, what's the neural signature? What's happening in their brain? But what you really want to look at is, of course, what's happening in their life. And there are many instances of once people get granted asylum, they wake up, usually pretty gradually, over a period of weeks and, and, and months and, and return to return to life. So these are real experiences and real symptoms. It's, it's not malingering or faking. It's, it's not consciously generated. It's, it's, it's kind of evidence that, that people can unconsciously generate a sleep-like state and remain in it for um, months. This is unconsciously generated. 
So there, there, there are quite a few interesting cases like that that uh, Suzanne O'Sullivan writes about that gives you know some weight to uh, the Sarno theory. Sarno also did, did a great job in, in in emphasizing how by looking at history, you know, how certain symptoms become very much in vogue at a particular time. You like to cite the, the Norwegian researcher, Hadel Schrader, who was working with uh, whiplash here in Norway. We were like the world champions in whiplash here in my native Norway. He went to Lithuania and they didn't have a single case. So how many doctors are being trained you know, to deal with a particular symptom? The media attention it gets, uh, insurance deals, where welfare deals. There, there's a lot of like sociological and economic system factors that influence what seems to turn into an epidemic. Like where have all the ulcers gone, for example? What happened to hysterical paralysis? And there's there's a lot of symptoms that people used to do historically that people don't do anymore. And in other cultures with, with, with other religious beliefs, um, people create wacky symptoms that we just don't have uh, at all. So, but, but, but I, I think the Freudian element is a kind of weak point of, um, of Sarno's teachings. I don't think it's the thing to emphasize the most. I think his strong emphasis on childhood and childhood trauma is also a weakness. I, I've found in my own work that when I stopped emphasizing that at all, the results got better. Uh, not worse. I think his methods, so uh, another weakness I think is that he does not at all seem to focus on rumination. So I have had quite a few clients who who have had excessive rumination, like a lot of rumination, they're just lost in thought. And then you help them dramatically reduce that and their pain clears. Sarno doesn't seem to uh, really go into that at all in terms of how you can change rumination and relate the thoughts differently. Uh, I also think that that the recommendations to journal, like to, to journal about your emotions, can be extremely useful. Uh, it, it can help you to orient from the physical to the psychological. It can help you to connect dots, see patterns, reach new conclusions. But a lot of people who don't change from chronic pain are doing a lot of journaling and they're just lost in excessive rumination, where the more they write about it, the, the more emphasis and strength and meaning they pour into these stories that they're essentially lost in. So, so one tip is to be careful with excessive journaling. Um, Another thing is that if you look at, you know, why do we feel a need to not experience certain thoughts or to not be in touch with certain emotional states? Why? Because at some level we have marked out those emotions and thoughts as dangerous or threatening. Why do they seem dangerous or threatening? Because either it looks as if we are identical with what we think and feel, that we are therefore kind of responsible for these thoughts and feelings, and therefore they say something really bad about us. Uh, so what I've found very useful in working with clients is meditative experiments. I, I call my particular approach the psychological illusion model, but various thought experiments you can do with people where they can discover the impersonal nature of thoughts, where, where they can kind of unhook that process of identification where it looks as if they essentially are the thoughts and the feelings that arise moment by moment. This is, of course, what many great meditation traditions 
attempt to do. Sarno did not seem to focus on this at all. And if, if you look at uh, today's third generation cognitive therapies like uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, metacognitive therapy, instead of being that obsessed with the content of what you think, it's more about changing the relationship to your thoughts and your feelings. As I said, you know, the identification, the, 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 the beliefs you have about your thoughts and your feeling, your relationship to them, the effects of patterns such as worry and rumination and threat monitoring. By working on that level, you can help people change their basic relationship to their thoughts and feelings in such a way that thoughts and feelings look way less threatening. Hence, way less of a need to repress and not be in contact with certain thoughts and feelings. That's an avenue to, to really look at to help clients. Um, in terms of working with people too, you know, having a good meditation practice to be able to be, become better at watching thoughts, seeing thoughts as thoughts instead of seeing them as facts, um, being better at actually feeling emotional states without getting lost in rumination and worry and storytelling. These sorts of skills can be developed through a experiential meditation practice. Sarno did not seem to emphasize or know much about this at all. Now, there's a lot of long-term meditators who struggle with chronic pain, who get duped by the exact mechanism that Sarno was so brilliant at exposing because they think that their pain is the result of something quote-unquote physical. So they're stuck with it, right? But combining the two is, is excellent. Uh, something else, as a guy who has a background in hypnosis, I remember Sarno being asked in one of his books, you know, what about hypnosis? And he, has, he essentially dismisses hypnosis. He seems to have inherited Freud's take on, on hypnosis. This is unfortunate because it's one thing to say, well, you can't just suggest symptoms away. But if you're seeing clients, you can often use good hypnotic processes, just like with meditation, to help people change their relationship to thoughts and feelings, to build better capacities for setting boundaries, adjusting expectations, uh, regulating emotion, you know, seeing thoughts as thoughts, these sorts of things. Experiential approaches such as hypnosis and meditation can be very useful. Uh, and, and Sarno seems to completely uh, dismiss that. Um, Another thing is emphasis on breath work. Um, I, I have to credit uh, a colleague in Australia, uh, an NLP trainer in Melbourne by the name of Amy Bell, who, who first alerted me to uh, heart rate variability and its relationship to pain. So I'm going to quote a guy here. Uh, let's see. This is from a book called Just Breathe by Dan Brule. Um, heart rate variability is a sign of a healthy heart. So this is from Dr. David O'Hare. When we breathe in, the heart speeds up. The mechanism is complex. It has to do with inhibiting the parasympathetic nervous system, the brake. It's like lifting our foot off the brake on a downhill slope. The car accelerates. When we exhale, the heart slows down. Like reapplying the brakes on a downhill slope, the car slows down. High HRV, heart rate variability, is linked to longevity and is inversely proportional to stress. The more stressed you are, the less your heart speeds up and slows down with every breath. Uh, the less stressed you are, the greater the rate, the range of your heart HRV. 
Various things reduce HRV, aging, chronic illnesses like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, stress, anxiety, depression, tobacco consumption or insomnia, and lack of exercise. So quoting Dan Brule here, we normally measure heart rate in beats per minute and we assume that a regular steady rhythm is good. In fact, a steady regular heart rate is the last thing you want. When we measure the heart rate in milliseconds, we find that the time between two heartbeats is never the same. I like this analogy by Brule. Imagine a tennis player waiting for her opponent's serve. She doesn't take a solid stance and she doesn't move in predictable direction or in a repetitive or mechanical way. She keeps moving, jumping, randomly shifting from one foot to the other. This is how she remains ready and able to respond in any direction at any time to whatever comes her way. A healthy heart is always adjusting to the internal and external environment. A healthy heart rate is irregular. Now, what Amy Bell pointed out to me, because she had struggled with uh, some chronic pain, what, what was that when HRV is low, chronic pain is much more likely. By increasing the HRV, uh, chronic pain is way less likely. You can manipulate and increase your HRV by doing slow, steady breathing. There's a lot of science showing that the ideal breath is about four and a half to five seconds, so that you get like five to six breaths uh, a minute. Uh, just by breathing like that for about five minutes, you get something called heart coherence that increases your HRV. So just doing three five minute rounds a day of slow breathing where you spend four and a half to six uh, minutes on every breathing cycle or in and out. Uh, uh, you, you, can, you can increase your HRV and thereby decrease your pain. So these are things that I have found very useful in, in my practice. Um, I should say and admit that not all of my clients change uh, with this stuff. I just got off the phone with a, a client in Sweden, uh, a psychiatrist who I worked with for, for several months. Uh, she has not changed her pain at all. I remember a couple of years ago, I worked with a, a woman from Germany who, who made some other good changes, but, but the pain didn't change much. So not all people change. Some people change moderately. And, and this is the case for Sarno and th this is the case for, for everyone else uh, as well. So I, I highly recommend looking into his books. Uh, there's a good podcast on the net by a guy called Dan Ratner called Crushing Doubt that I think is, is pretty good. Um, I'd love to hear your comments, uh, your thoughts. Please post them wherever you find this video. Know that I see clients on Skype from all over this spinning planet. If you want to work with me, you can reach me at provocativehypnosis.com. If by any chance you're watching this video in 2022, know that I'm doing a seminar on how to work with chronic pain, July 2nd and 3rd in London, UK. Go to provocativehypnosis.com, the seminar page, and you will find a link. Till next time, thanks for listening.